All right, now this little phrase here, good news, is an ancient word in the Greek language that is euangelion. Let's say that together. I'm kidding, all right? Euangelion, which basically means good news. Now, this was declared by every time a Caesar would marry or have kids. And the town scribes would come out and say, we have euangelion. The Caesar has had another child, and it's a male child, which means the, the, the empire will continue. We have good news. And the way they viewed Caesars back then were gods. There is a son of God born, euangelion, which means good news. And the angels burst on the scene, and they say something that would have been scandalous back then. They said, we have euangelion, good news. And that is the Messiah, the son of the one true God, has been born. This phrase, euangelion, good news, is also translated gospel. This is the phrase we often misunderstand. What we're going to talk about today and the next few weeks has the potential to change how you view God and faith and Jesus and everything. Here's why. There are some of you who have been Christians for a long time and you are exhausted. You feel like you are running on a treadmill to get to a destination you can never get to. You feel like you are trying to do enough good deeds to make God not just love you, but actually like you. You feel like you have to do so many good works to get God's attention and maybe his forgiveness. And maybe, if you're lucky, cross your fingers, knock on wood, he'll let you into heaven. Gospel changes all of that. And some of you have stayed away or strayed away from church, from faith, from God, from Jesus, from Bible, because you had this misunderstanding of the word gospel, thinking it was something that you could never achieve or never live up to or didn't really have much power for your life. Let's talk about what this word often is misunderstood to mean. For many of us, the phrase gospel simply means a command to obey. In other words, stop sinning, knock it off, Jesus is coming, look busy. That's kind of what we view as good news. But listen, that's not good news, that's not even new news. Every major religion has some form of, here's what you've got to do, and if you don't, there's going to be hell to pay. But that's not gospel. For many of us, gospel simply means a prayer to pray. In other words, I prayed a prayer, so I'm in. I said the magic words. I asked Jesus into my heart. Somebody else prayed for me, and so God and I are good. In other words, I've covered the minimal requirements to get into heaven. But gospel's bigger than that. For some of us, we just sum it up this way. The word gospel just simply means the first four books of the New Testament. The gospel according to Matthew and to Mark and to Luke and to John. And true, we do refer to them as the biographies of Jesus as being the gospel because it's good news. But that is because of what's in them, not the title of the book. In the first century, Paul was this guy that did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, did not believe that to be euangelion or good news. He thought Jesus was a guy that was trying to distract his Jewish people. And so he would spend time trying to stamp out and stomp out the uh, expressions of church that were happening as people were claiming to be followers of Jesus. He would persecute them. He would arrest them. He would have them killed. And then he met Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. And he had this experience face-to-face with Jesus. And it changed everything because he experienced gospel, not a list of rules, not a magic prayer, but an experience with Jesus. And he spent the rest of his life telling people about this good news. Take a look at how Paul talks about this to a church in Rome. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news Because it is the 
power. Now notice that. It is the power of God that brings salvation, not the information of God, not the rules of God, not the condemnation of God, but the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It's come first to the Jew because Jesus was Jewish, and now it's come to the Gentiles, which is all of us, everybody. In other words, it is the power of God. That's what the gospel is. God has given us this power, which means if you've got a past, the gospel can erase it. If you've got an addiction, the gospel can break it. If you've got a fear, the gospel can calm it. If you've got brokenness, the gospel can fix it. If you've got pain, the gospel can heal it. If you've got boredom in your life, the gospel brings adventure. And over these next few weeks, we're going to unpack what gospel means for you and me, and it's so much bigger than a magic prayer or just a set of rules. In fact, this is a prayer we're going to learn how to say together. We're going to put this up on the screen, and I'm going to ask you to read this with me out loud. And over the next few weeks, we're going to break this down. Here's what it says. Jesus, thank you that there is nothing I can do that would make you love me more and nothing I have done that makes you love me less. Your presence and approval are all I need for everlasting joy. As you have been to me, so I will be to others. As I pray, I'll measure, I'll measure your compassion by the cross and your power by the resurrection. That is the gospel. Now, everybody who is going to like, hear this for the first time and you want in, Join us at Beach Baptisms at the conclusion of this series. Anybody who wants a little extra reading, here's a book that will be very helpful, that was very helpful in preparing this series, simply called Gospel, by a pastor by the name of J.D. Greer. But here's where we're starting today. And that is, the gospel, the good news, doesn't start with what we've done or what we need to do. It starts with what God has done. And that's key. Because true love for God cannot grow when we are unsure about his feelings for us. For all of you who have heard people say, I love God, I love Jesus, God loves you, all those kind of things, and there's something in you that just doesn't feel right, it's probably because you don't know how much God loves you. And even my saying that makes some of us go, yeah, but I haven't done enough. Yeah, but I, I'm still, I still got a lot of things to work out. I'm still a work in progress because you're still trying to earn it. But gospel says, oh, no, no, no. He loved you before you did anything wrong or anything right. He loves you because he created you. And he loves you enough to die for you. Now, this is what the Apostle Paul discovered. This guy who once was opposed to Jesus and then spent the rest of his life telling people about Jesus and even literally lost his head because of him telling people about Jesus, this is what he discovered, the power of the gospel. Here's what he writes to this church in Rome. We're going to read through these passages together to get a clear understanding of what good news this really is for us. He says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Okay? The law is basically our good works. Now, specifically back then, they would have thought of all the rules they had to keep, but, but you know what I'm talking about. There's these laws that you think you've got to do in order to make your spouse happy or, or to make your parents happy or, or, in this case, maybe to make God happy. And we kind of see this in the, 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 the Garden of Eden because Adam and Eve sin and they realize they're naked. And so they, the first thing they do is they cover themselves. They go get a fig leaf, and sometimes, you know, the, the pictures depict this really, really well. But I want you to imagine this for just a second. If you wake up discovering you had been sleepwalking, and you wandered into Walmart in the middle of the night, buck naked, okay? Now, we've all seen crazy things at Walmart, but we probably haven't seen that, right? Right? The first thing that you would do would not be, well, while I'm here, I need to get some supplies and start walking around and picking up odds and ends. No, you would head to the clothing section immediately to cover yourself. 
And that is the idea that we have when it comes to how we have failed at being good enough for God. There is this shame that we all have. And we've been trying to cover that up since the garden. We have this idea, don't look at my shame. So we say, look at what a great realtor I am. Look at what a great teacher I am. Look at what a great parent I am. Look at my Instagram page and how wonderful my life is and how wonderful my meal is and how wonderful my kids are. Well, they're not that wonderful. I mean, we all got the same problems, right? <clears throat> look at how successful I am at work. And maybe it's even, look at what a great Christian I am. We're trying to distract people from the shame that we have. And Paul says, the good works you're trying to do are never enough. For most of us, our life is like one big episode of Survivor, and we're trying to talk everybody into not voting us off the island. And Paul says it's never going to be enough. 